I get to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Pratt today. Um, for those of, who, uh, those of you who weren't here yesterday, he is uh, the president and founder of Third Millennium Ministries um, and also a professor at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson and in Orlando uh, for many years. Um, what many of you may not know is that he has a strong connection to Covenant College in a lot of ways. Um, as he mentioned yesterday, he's from Roanoke, Virginia, uh, where he went to church with Chris Dodson and his uh, friends with, with Chris. Um, he actually attended Covenant for one year as a freshman, uh, where Reg McClellan taught him uh, philosophy. Um, before Richard returned to Roanoke to finish college at uh, Roanoke College. Um, he was on faculty with Reg McClellan at RTS Jackson for a time, uh, then moved to RTS Orlando, uh, where he was the teacher of uh, Kelly Capick for, for one, uh, Scott Wells, our RUF minister here at Covenant College, um, David Norman in advancement, uh, David and I were classmates together. Um, he was uh, also uh, the teacher of Ron Thomas, uh, who heads grounds here at RTS Orlando. Doug Simons, our baseball coach, sat in on some of his classes. And um, actually, John Wingard uh, was his first TA uh, in RTS Jackson. Uh, so a lot of us here have been influenced by him as his uh, students. And of course, uh, many others in other kinds of ways, uh, many around the world. And now his granddaughter, Maggie, uh, goes to school here, and she's in my class, which is really fun. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Richard Pratt. Good morning, everybody. Should I say happy Halloween? Is that OK? No, happy All Hallows' Eve and happy Reformation Day. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's great. Um, I really am glad to be, have been with you these last couple of days. It's a great privilege, and thank you for making the old man feel okay about himself. Old men need that. If you didn't know, I'll just tell you, old men need that a lot. I see, I see them all nodding their heads out there. Am I telling the truth, men? Am I telling the truth, men? Thank you very much. There they are, okay. Yeah, old men need the affirmation of the young people, okay? So give it to them every chance you get. But I am glad to be with you and to talk with you for a few minutes more about the future of the Reformation. Remember, my assignment from Dr. Capick was not to talk about the past, but to talk about the future, right? Uh, now, we've got to do it in the light of the past, so we've got to make a few connections, but... About all I know about Martin Luther was that little toy that I brought in here yesterday. That's about how much I know about him. And I think it's a cute little toy, and that's probably really what I think of him as. It's just a cute guy from the past. But I do believe that what he and others in the Reformation stood for is relevant for us today. And if we can grab it and catch the wave of that, Keonda, uh, we can move forward, we can actually power forward at a very difficult time in the history of the church in our part of the world. Um, you stand at the precipice of a very difficult time coming to the evangelical believing church in North America. Those of you who are not from North America or will not stay here, um, I'm sure you're going to have your difficulties too, but I just want to alert everyone in the room here that if you're not aware of what's likely to be happening to you and to me as followers of Jesus and to your children, your children, who are coming very quickly, um, you, you need to become aware of it. You need to become aware of the fact that we are going to be facing more and more opposition, and as we face more and more opposition, we are going to be tempted at greater pace and with greater strength to compromise our faith to become a part of a system that is not ours, the system of this world. And we all face that every day, but when the pressure starts mounting, some will be able to stand. 
Some will be able to stand like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, and others. Some will be able to stand and say, no, our hope is not in this world, but in the world to come, and we will live for that world. Thank you very much. I hope that will be you. Because the future for those who buy into the world to come is a very bright future, a very glorious future. And those who conform to this world and become lost in this world and its promises are going to be sorely disappointed. We're going to look again at the Lord's Prayer as we did yesterday. So just to remind ourselves, I'm going to ask you to recite it with me again, okay? And remember, we only have debtors in here, so if you're a trespasser, you're off the hook, no problem. But if you've got any debt, and I suspect some of you do, it's a problem. Here we go. Jesus taught his disciples to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we bow before you, calling no one in this world our teacher but you. And we do that because we trust no one like we trust in you. We hope in no one like we hope in you. We long to see no one like we long to see you. And so we pray now that Holy Spirit will come to us, that he'll fill every heart in this room, that we may be set free, set free to serve you and to honor you. And as you do it, we will give you the glory for it. Amen. Do you remember yesterday that I suggested that everybody needs to sort of get themselves oriented toward the things that are in the Lord's Prayer because important things are the things you pray about? Do you remember that? So yeah, I got it. Okay, good. But then I suggested that a lot of us sort of naturally gravitate toward the bottom half of the Lord's Prayer because down there we pray about things that, well, they mean a lot to us personally and even as families and as a church, as a large group, even a college like this. Um, give us this day our daily bread, which means, Lord, please take care of me. Take care of my needs. Uh, forgive us our debts, which means I'm sorry. I did it again. Please forgive me. And lead us not into temptation, which means, basically, help me do better tomorrow than I did today. And those things should be important to you. There's nothing worse than depersonalizing your Christian faith for the sake of some larger vision, even the vision that I'm trying to give to you today you must always have that personal longing, that personal desire, even that personal relationship with God that allows you to come to him and to say those kinds of things in faith and in hope that he will respond to you. It's very necessary. Don't ever lose sight of the need for your personal encounter, even heightened religious ecstasy as a Christian so that you can then take your eyes and put them upstairs in the first half of the Lord's Prayer. But in our culture, being as oriented toward me and oriented toward the people that are close to me and focused on the things that are important to my personal life, we do sometimes, even as Christians, as Christians who love the Bible and who love Jesus, sometimes fail to take into account that the first half of the Lord's Prayer is the first half that it sets the stage for what follows down at the bottom that deals more with our personal lives. And you'll remember that yesterday what we did was we talked about the first petition, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I suggested to you that there Jesus, rather than speaking of God as your sweet granddaddy who gives you everything you want and whose only desire is for you to love him back and for you to be happy, which is what great-grandfathers, wonderful grandfathers do. And if you have a good grandfather, then you know that's true. You can make him do anything, right? All you got to do is ask for something, and it's there, okay? That's the way I am, okay? I'm not a fool. I want my grandchildren to love me, okay? Okay, and, okay but rather than being that, he is our royal father. He's our king 
who is enthroned in heaven. And our chief desire is to see him exalted as king in our lives and exalted everywhere by all creatures so that his name may be kept holy. And that is our driving purpose as servants of our great King Jesus, that the Father may be honored and glorified. But Jesus, while calling on his disciples to adjust what they believed about God, he moves on in the top half of the Lord's Prayer to adjust the ways they believed, the ways they behaved, the ways they felt about something else too. And you know it's true, but let me go ahead and say it. It's strange sounding, but it was this important to him. He adjusted, and he wanted them to adjust, and he wants us to adjust how we think about the earth. This thing you're doing right now called human life on planet earth. Now, I know you've not experienced life anywhere else. (laughs) That goes without saying, doesn't it? But let me just warn you that this thing you're experiencing right now called human life on earth is fleeting. It's just momentary. And I, when I was at your age and when I was in school like you were right now as a freshman here, in fact, on this campus, I sort of imagined that my life would just go on forever. But it doesn't. So maybe if Jesus is adjusting what we think about this thing called life on planet Earth, maybe we need to listen up and listen up quickly because your chance to do it the right way is passing every moment. Happy? So what's he say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. You see, I told you he's thinking of God as king. Our Father, your kingdom come. (laughs) That used to be something that Christians talked about a lot, when the kingdom comes. I don't know that we had much idea of what it meant, but we would throw it around. In fact, it was sort of a catchphrase that Christians would use a lot. I had a grandmother who would always say, when the kingdom comes. I mean, we would go into the kitchen and ask if we could have another piece of pie or some more ice cream or something, and she would say, why, sure, when the kingdom comes. So I learned around four years old that the kingdom coming meant, no, never, leave me alone, you're bothering me. And that's, it was just something out there, when the kingdom come. And it is one of those phrases like praise the Lord, or glory be to God, or holy. These are terms we throw around and sometimes don't think much about what they mean. So what in the world, Jesus, did you mean when you said, may your kingdom come? Well, it's not that hard because he tells us right away. May your kingdom come, may your will be done. Okay, I can get that. I can get that. I mean, what kind of king would he be if his will was not being done? But, but Jesus, uh, where do you want the kingdom? Where do you want God's will to be done? And this is the surprise. This is the shocker. Because it will take your religion and turn it on its head. Where does he want it to be? May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I want you to notice something there. Heaven is not the destiny of the kingdom of God. Earth is the destiny. Heaven is the standard for what Jesus wanted to be true here. That God's will would be done here like it is already done in that heavenly throne room. Remember how we said yesterday that all through the Bible, uh, the portrait of heaven is that it's an exotic imperial courtroom where God sits on a throne and blinding light radiates from him, where a river of fire pours out from beneath his feet, where all these creatures are crying out, holy, holy, holy. And it's a magnificent thing where myriads upon myriads of spirits and creatures of all sorts are surrounding him, worshiping him and honoring him in this vast heavenly throne room well the question before us then is if Jesus wants what happens up there to happen down here if he wants God's will as it's done up there to be true down here just how will that look 
Well, when you read the Bible again and you notice the places where it describes what goes on in that throne room, I want you to notice that the creatures in that throne room do exactly what God on his throne commands them to do. Even the devil, when he's in the throne room of God, says, yes, your majesty. He does not even think for a moment, the thought does not even enter his mind that he should disobey the one who is on the throne. And believe me, if you and I were before the blinding radiance of God's glory on his throne, we would not think of doing anything contrary to his will either. It would be intuitive. We'd be fully convinced, I'm not going to cross that one, that's for sure. But when the devil leaves that throne room, he does things that he wants to do, just like you and I, who are not in the throne room yet. Um, we do what we want to do down here. But Jesus' dream, Jesus' vision for the future, and Jesus' reason for coming to this earth would be so that the earth would become the place where God's will is done as extensively, as universally, as it is already being done in that throne room. Now, if you and I had written that prayer, given what most of us learned as children growing up in the Christian faith, we probably would not have written it quite that way. We might have said something like this, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in heaven, because that's where we're going to spend eternity, and we really want it to be nice up there, and this earth, it's, uh, it's not making it. But Jesus did not think that way at all. He came here for a reason. He's coming back here for a reason. And it's a reason that is rooted in the Bible from the beginning to the end. From the very beginning, the reason God made the world was so that this would be the theater, as it were, within which he demonstrated to every creature, whether spiritual or physical, who is the king of the universe. He was going to make this place his kingdom so that every creature would bow. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus gave his whole life to that. And he calls on you and me to do the same. Can you see how that sort of flips it upside down for you? Yes, it's true that when you die, you'll go to heaven, you'll be in that heavenly court, and yes, that will be a wonderful experience, but that is not the end, that's not the goal. The goal and the dream and the vision that you and I have is to come back with King Jesus to the world made new. And then God will fill the sky, fill the sky with his glory. Jesus is coming back one day. And when he comes back and all things are made new, all of that will belong to him because he's the one that accomplished it. He lived like you in this earth and he passed every test that could possibly be given to a human being, passed it and was faithful. And because of that, he received this great reward. As he told his disciples one day, just before he left the planet, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And you know what that basically meant was, it meant, hey guys, I'm all that. I was that good. So that the Father now has rewarded me with kingship over everything. All of this earth of yours, heaven and earth, the creation, it now belongs to me. But the wonder and the glory of it all is that when Jesus returns, he will look at you who followed him, you who have faith in him, and he will say it all belongs to you as well. But when Jesus said that to his disciples, that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, if you and I had been he at that point, we probably would have said something like this. You know, since I'm the one going to do it, since I'm the one that owns everything, all of you who follow me, just sit back and watch this show. It's going to be fantastic. 
It'll be glorious. You'll be shocked at all the things I'm going to do. But that's not what he said, is it? On that day, just before he left the planet, he didn't say, sit back and watch the show. What did he say? He looked at them and he said, therefore, because I get it all, because I'm going to make everything new one day, it's all mine, you go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and don't worry for a moment, I'll be with you right up to the end. In other words, he looked at his disciples, people like you and me, people who are not as good as he is, people who are not as powerful as he is, people who stumble and fall like you and I do, just like his apostles did, and he looked at them and he said, now, this is going to be great one day, but right now what I want you to understand is I'm giving you one of the greatest privileges a human being could possibly have. While it all belongs to me, while all authority in heaven and earth is mine, and while one day I'm going to make all things new, listen up, all of you who follow me, you have the privilege of joining me in turning the earth into the kingdom of God. When you get to my age, you see a lot of well-intended purposes and goals fail. You get to see people who are very sincere about their cause, who give a great deal to a cause, but it fails. Jesus is the authority over heaven and earth. His cause will not fail. One way or another, it's going to happen that God's will will be done on this planet as it is in that heavenly throne room. But the wonder of it all is that he calls you and me into a program, into a mission, into a destiny that cannot fail. It's a great privilege to know that because most people in the world, they do not. So let's think about it for just a minute. Let's think about how much of a contrast that may be when a Christian buys into that vision and when they don't. Think about it this way. Uh, let's imagine you're talking to a friend of yours who's not a believer. Now, I mean somebody that makes no pretense of being a Christian. And you say to them this. You say, tell me this. Answer this question. What do you think would be a good life? A good life. A, glad, a, a life you'd be glad to have lived. So that at the last minute, as you're taking your last breath, you could say, I'm glad I lived this life rather than some other life. What kind of life would that be? Most, most of the people that you know, just sort of looking around the room and kind of knowing who comes to a school like Covenant College, uh, most of us would say that our unbelieving friends would probably answer something like this. Well, I hope to finish school. That'd be great. Graduate, yeah. And you know, um, everybody needs money, so if I could get a job, that'd be good. In fact, if I could get a job that makes a lot of money, then I can retire early and I can enjoy life before I get too old to enjoy life. That I really want. If I have kids, they need to do well. That's important to me. But, you know, this unbeliever would say, I know that sometime or another in the future, I'm going to get sick like everybody else does, and I'm going to die like everybody else does, but I sure hope that I'm going to die in the middle of the night. Because then you just kind of go to sleep and you die and you don't even know what's going to happen. And if it's going to be a good life, I hope that if I wake up after I'm dead and I discover there is a God, I hope he'll agree with me that I was good enough to get into heaven. Now think about your unbelieving friends. Isn't that basically where they live? That I hope that if I wake up after I die that God will agree with me that I'm good enough to get in on balance. Well, maybe there's even someone here today in this room who thinks that that is the way it's going to be. I hate to tell you this, but let me just go ahead and say it. There's never been anybody that good who on balance will be allowed into heaven because of the way they've lived. So there's only been one person, only one person who's been that good. And that's why Christians talk about standing in Jesus' shadow. That's why we do that. 
And that's why we hold on to Him. That's why we get into Him and say, let me in with you, please. And He says, okay, trust me. I'll get you in. He was that good. But now let's change the question. Let's ask that same question, but rather than asking it to an unbeliever, let's ask it to the believers that you know. Now, I mean a real Christian, okay? The kind that would choose to go to a Christian college. How's that? Mm. You know, the people that go to church, people that read the Bible, people that might even show up for a small group, things like that. A, a real Christian person. And you were to ask that Christian person, tell me this, what's your idea of a good life? I mean the kind of life you would be glad to have lived so that at the last minute, as you're taking your last breath, you would say, I'm glad I lived this life rather than some other life. What would we say? Well, we might say things like these. I sure do hope to finish school. Graduating is important. And you know, if I could get a job, everybody needs a job, and if I could make a lot of money in that job, well then I could retire early and then I could enjoy life before I get too old to enjoy life. And you know, if I have kids, I really want my kids to do well too. Everybody's going to get sick and die, but, you know, I just really want to die with as little pain as possible. And even Christians will say, uh, I hope that I'll die in the middle of the night because I just want to kind of go to sleep and know it's not, not know it's going to happen. And, of course, that's when the story changes, right? Now, personally, I think dying in the middle of the night is not the way I want to go. I've always prayed for a two-minute warning. Two-minute warning. Because I've got some things to say. So if, if you find out that Richard Pratt has died and my wife and daughter, or either of them is there, they're going to have their cell phones. They promised me, I'm going to get my two minutes. I'm going to let it rip for two minutes. Watch it, it'll be on Facebook. It'll be great. I won't have anything to lose at that point. But most people, I know that's weird, because most people don't want that. They don't want to know what's going to happen, and they just kind of want to fade away. But that is where the story changes, right? Because we believe that as believers... Because we've trusted in Jesus, when we die, our souls will begin to shake like this, sprout wings and fly away to heaven. And when we get there, St. Peter will be there at the gate, and he'll say, come on in, you have the blood of Jesus on you, but wait just a minute. And he'll run over to a big closet and pull out a gigantic golden harp and hand it to you. And he'll say this to you, now take this harp, over there is your place in the choir. Start playing that harp and singing forever and forever and forever, and forever, and forever. Um, that sounds more to me like the other side rather than heaven. You ever been in a choir? It's okay for a few hours. I could even maybe do it for 10,000 years in heaven, but forever is a lot longer than 10,000 years. Well, I have great news for you, Christian. Great news for you. Jesus did not die on the cross so that you would receive a golden heart. Jesus did not resurrect from the dead so you would spend eternity as a disembodied spirit floating around in wherever that is up there called heaven. Jesus is not ruling over this planet today making all of his enemies under his feet so that you would spend eternity disconnected from this place. And Jesus is not coming back one day so that you will continue to exist as a spirit in the heavens in a choir playing a harp and singing forever. No, Jesus did all those things for the sake of the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. He did all those things so that this creation would be made new. He did all those things and He will come back again one day so that you will be with Him in the new heavens and the new earth. And it will be yours. Nothing less than that is worthy of Jesus. And nothing less than that is worthy of you. You are the child of the king of the universe. You belong to him. And his great son, our Messiah, has won it all for us. How could we ever settle for thinking that the best thing we can hope for is to drift away one day and get a golden harp? 
When that becomes your greatest dream, do you know how hard it is to let go of life now in this world? There's an old beer commercial, 100 years old must be. It said, you only go around once in life, so grab all the gusto you can. Drink our beer. Well, there are a couple of lies in that commercial. One is that beer gives you gusto. What it gives you is a belly. You don't want it. Okay? But there's another lie in that. And it is that you only go around once in this earth. You go around twice in God's creation, this physical world we're a part of, and the way you live the first time affects the way you live the second time. And boy, it will be glorious. That is our dream. That is our vision. That is our hope. That's why Covenant Cottage exists. Because it calls on you and equips you to move out into the world, reaching the ends of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for some of you, that will be an extraordinary, obviously extraordinary, visually extraordinary life of sacrifice and devotion. For some of you, it will mean even dying for Jesus. For others of you, according to the calling of God, externally, as they take videotapes of your life, it will look a lot like other people's lives. But if they could just get inside, if they could just look inside your heart and into your private life, and they can see what goes on in the privacy of your home and in the privacy of the secret things you do, they would see the extraordinary devotion to this kingdom of God. Some of you will become ministers. Some of you will become professional Christians. Some of you will become missionaries. Some of you will make great, obvious, ostensibly obvious sacrifices for the kingdom. Others of you, please, are going to go out there in the business world and make so much money you're able to send those other people into the kingdom work. But when they zero in on you, as that business person, as that teacher, as that mother, as that father, as that neighbor, as that upper middle class person you're likely to become, many of you, when they zoom in and they look and see what your life is actually like, do you know what they're going to see if you love the Lord Jesus and serve His kingdom purpose? They're going to see people who are generous. They're going to see people who care about others. They're going to see parents who sacrifice for their children. They're going to see neighbors who know their next-door neighbor. They're going to see people who are reaching out in small and gentle and kind ways and changing the world step by step into the kingdom of God. Find your place in that kingdom and you will see the glory of the world to come. Even now, you get glimpses of it. Even in a world full of sin and death, you see it. But in that day, God's own glory will light up the world. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. That's what it's all about. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we delight in you and thank you so much that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. Thank you for all you've done to earn that place. Now give us eyes to see, hearts to feel these things, and the will to obey. Amen.